Welcome, everyone. For the next 30 minutes, I'll try to entertain you with what it looks like to guide the Kubernetes community, be at the steer, be at the helm of the project. So let's start quickly with introducing the remaining part of the steering committee, which is not present today with me, but I'm a, the main representative. So we have Steven, who is a head of open source at Cisco. We have Benjamin, who is a software engineer working at Google. Uh, Sasha is representing Red Hat as a software engineer. There's Patrick, who's again representing Intel this time around. Antonio is another Googler sitting in the steering committee uh, from Spain. Myself and, and Paco, who's leading open source in DAO Cloud. So as you see, we have very diverse community, uh, diverse uh, steering committee. Um, folks are ranging from US through Europe all the way to China. The Kubernetes community is pretty big by now. I was actually, when I was presenting and putting, refreshing those statistics for November 2024, we actually crossed more than 90,000 contributors um, working for us, working with us. The last time that we did this presentation in Paris, about six months ago, we were at 88,000. So as you see, the, the numbers are growing quickly, continuously. We have more than 1,200 uh, 1, people in Kubernetes organization, Kubernetes org and Kubernetes 6. The project itself consists of more than 360 repos and community groups, that's special interest groups or war groups, and I'll talk about them in a moment. There's more than 30 uh, currently. The project itself, as you can see by the numbers that the CNCF put in their report, is the fourth open source project by developer activity and a fifth project by the number of pull requests on GitHub. So those are pretty big numbers and we will be talking a little bit how we got there when I'll reach the, the second part of this today's presentation. But we've, before we dive into the history of the Kubernetes project, because still we're in the 10th year of the Kubernetes project, we want to cherish that anniversary. Let me go back quickly into describing what a Kubernetes steering committee actually do. And there's no better way to quote part of the charter that we have, which describes all the roles or all the responsibilities of a um, steering members. So the Kubernetes steering committee is the governing uh, body of the project, providing decision-making and oversight to the Kubernetes project bylaws, sub-organization, and financial planning. And also we define the project structure and values. So there's like a whole lot of information packed in just this one or two sentences, but basically it boils down to we make sure that the project and the community can thrive and can actually focus on delivering the features, working on them on a daily basis, making sure that the CI infrastructure is working, making sure and discussing with CNCF the necessary resources, whether those are financial resources or uh, various other resources that the CNCF provides for the project as a whole, and delivering them to our contributors so that they can focus on actually working on their daily task, which is whether that's uh, opening PRs, working on the code changes, or uh, improving our documentations or providing support for new contributors. So, like I've mentioned before, we've been doing those presentations usually every KubeCon EU and KubeCon North America. So a quick round of updates between what, hap what happened between March of this year and today. And honestly, there's not a whole lot of updates that actually happened. So the one important information, if, you, if you've not been uh, carefully paying attention, we had uh, new elections. So every steering member is chosen for two-year term. But we divided the steering uh, committee 
such that every member, there is an overlap. Half of the steering member is being swapped every other, every year. So I got into steering member last year with a four different members and those three members were uh, elected or in case of Benjamin, he got re-elected again for, for his second term. So Sasha and Antonio are entirely new steering members. They're uh, starting just now, literally for the over a month or so. And like I mentioned, and Benjamin is on his second term that it will be due in, in 2026. So I've mentioned that the entire community is, is the people and to celebrate the, the 10th anniversary of the project, I wanted to go quickly through the history of the project and most importantly, the people that were part of the steering committee in the past. And there's no better way to do it than to ask them what they think about the project, how they were experiencing their role as the steering, member, steering members, and how they are seeing the, the future for the project. And to do that, we basically send them uh, those five questions. And we've got so many interesting and inspiring answers because uh, to, to, to tell you the truth, we actually send those questions before the, um, the March presentation. And the original goal is that we will only use those answers for March timeframe and for the March presentation. But we actually got so deep and interesting responses that we only were able to accommodate a couple of them for the March presentations. And so to cherish the past steering members and share with you all their thoughts, we figured out that we wanna do a second round of, uh, of, their, of their thoughts that we wanna share with you all uh, today on, on this stage. So I divided the, their answers, which as you probably saw, into four areas. And the first area that I wanted to highlight is the community and what the past steering members have to say about the, the Kubernetes uh, community, how they saw uh, the growth. So both Nikita and Paris were, were pointing out how big and how quickly the community grew. We have contributors spanning from uh, US all over to China, uh, from, from Norway all the way down to Africa. So no matter where you, where you get in the globe, there is very likely that there will be a person that is one way or the other contributing to the project or to the entire community ecosystem if you even think about the entire cloud native uh, landscape. Paris also pointed out that the Slack, which was pretty quickly growing thanks to the Kubernetes community, we crossed uh, 180,000 people very quickly, and we are still able to thrive and communicate with one another across the globe thanks to the, uh, the growth that the project was seeing and thanks to the, the work that the Slack uh, team was doing for us. Uh, Paris also pointed out that behind the success of the Kubernetes project are the shadow programs. I can speak for that because as since I'm also a chair for a tech lead for SIGAPS, which is a special interest group that is responsible for all the controllers in the Kubernetes, as well as the special interest group CLI, which is responsible for the kubectl. We've also run shadow programs where we were trying to bring additional new members, new contributors, and help them grow in the ranks of, of contributors, uh, helping them put together first PRs and eventually uh, helping them grow in the community ladders. Joe pointed out, which is very, very on point, that the community was more than just the code. And that is one of the main reasons behind the current success of the project. There is a there is a very interesting quote that I know from a different community, from Brad Cannon, from Python community. He he said that he came for the technology by stay, but stayed for the people, 
And this is so much true also if you look at the Kubernetes community. If you talk to one another or if you want to reach out to any of the Kubernetes members, I know they are sometimes very busy. It's sometimes hard to get their responses. But if you talk to them and this week, which is like the best opportunity to talk to a lot of the core contributors to Kubernetes project, they are very down to earth people and they are always happy to share their thoughts, their ideas, or the, their past decisions, which are sometimes good, otherwise bad, with regards to what the Kubernetes today is, uh, or you can even ask them what would they change if they had the power to go back in time because they have a lot of different opinions about various things. That's an interesting uh, conversation starter if you're curious. Tim pointed out that uh, the growth has happened in basically all possible dimensions. And he pointed out that today there are KubeCons, which are more than 10,000 people spanning from Europe, uh, North America, India. Uh, there will be KubeCon happening in Japan next year. So as you can see, there's like so many big events. But then on top of that, there are also smaller events such as Cube Days that are happening like in multiple locations across the globe. Clayton. Uh, Clayton pointed out that it's important and probably the most important bit is to make sure that we are a community of people and that we need to make sure that all the people's voices are being heard and that we always cherish every single contribution and make sure that the people have the time and the energy and are being listened when they are contributing to the project. So aside from the community and, and, and their growth, the, another venue that I wanted to quickly discuss is the technical challenges that the past steering members were able to point out. And that's probably one of the quotes that I could not reuse from last time because that's, I hope that it will be like the, the biggest one from Tim, which is about half of the internet uh, depends on you, so no pressure. Uh, I could not reuse that same quote again. We used it last time and I was like, yeah, of all the quotes, I have to do it again because it is, there's like so much information just behind those couple of words about the success of, of the project and also the challenges that are coming from that. But them uh, nicely points out that the explosion of the ecosystem and the widespread adoption is only next to Linux. And that's so very true. If you remember the numbers that I was talking about earlier, where we are fourth biggest project, fifth if you count the number of pull requests that are happening to the project. That is mind blowing. And, and the people who are behind the project uh, is just astounding. Uh, Brian pointed out that we will Whatever happens, Kubernetes is designed in such a way it will adopt to the workloads of the next decade. I've heard multiple rumors that people were, were saying that, oh, if we don't do this or if Kube doesn't do that, it will get quickly replaced by something else. I cannot imagine that you would be able to quickly replace a decade of experience and the man hours that have been put into the project as it is today and start something from scratch because it doesn't solve a particular one use case. So whatever happens, uh, the benefit for everyone is that Kubernetes can be expanded. I'm not saying it's an easy option because like it was mentioned a couple of times, we still have like half of the internet that depends on us. So we can't just blindly do every single change. We always have to keep that in mind, that that half internet still depends on us. Uh, Derek pointed out that the, stable of the, the stability of the platform is the key. And no matter what you're gonna do in the distributed computing, we will always be able to fill the gaps and address the problems that are happening. But because we've been proven for so long that we are able to deliver whatever people require, that there's no chance that we will not 
meet that same requirements over the next decades to come for the project. But aside from the technical challenges, there's equally a big uh, bucket of non-technical challenges that the past steering members were pointing out. Paris uh, was pointing out that being the only woman for a while and not having her voice heard is a major problem. And I was actually talking about this particular problem on Monday with the rest of the uh, community, uh, contributor community. Because if you remember the slide where, where I had all the steering members, even though we are spanning all the globe, the entire globe, all the continents almost, the biggest problem that we currently have is that we are primarily software engineers and, primarily, and, and only males. We would like to be able to change that and make sure that all the voices are heard, like Paris is saying, because each and every single person brings something different to the table. And that's an important topic because without Paris, without Sarah's work, uh, Sarah was also one of the past steering members. If I remember correctly, Sarah was on the bootstrap steering, which means the first steering that was kicking off the entire uh, documentation of what the project does, how it's going to work, and so forth. Uh, Tim pointed out that steering is hard work, and I can totally agree with that. Although I will add a caveat that my past year has been somewhat okay-ish. Uh, a lot will depend on what is happening, not only with the project, but also around the project. The past, I when I took the baton of becoming a steering member, I spent a lot of time talking to the past steering members and asking them about roughly the same questions about the challenges. How can I prepare for, I don't know, the next pandemic or, or challenges such as Black Lives Matter, the Ukrainian war, and something like that. Because for every single one of those events, there was a questions that were popping up on the steering, how the community should react, what should be our response to the events that are happening and are affecting each and every single member of our community. Brian pointed out that it's the most important thing is, and the most challenging is to figure out what, to want, what you want to do, because doing everything is possible, but we only have so, so much time that we can achieve. And unfortunately, with, with limited resources that are happening with every single day and every single month, we need to be able to, to figure out and focus on the most important things. And like I was mentioning earlier, because Brian was also part of the, the initial uh, bootstrapping steering committee, he mentioned that there were no blueprints for how to run a project like ours. So the best option that they could do, and they, that's what they basically do, is they reach out to other communities, other projects, Linux, Node.js, and multi, op, uh, OpenStack, and uh, multiple others, and they were asking for input. And each and every single project and leaders of those projects were willing to spend the time with them and answer those questions. That's why the, the openness of the open source and the people, most importantly, the people behind the open source is, is unmatchable uh, currently. Okay, slowly moving forward because I know that I have a couple more minutes. Uh, the last topic is the sustainability, which is something that I scratched a couple of times when, when I was covering the previous topics. So, Dems mentioned that the most important bit, and that's something that each and every single one of us, and we can e equally apply this to our day jobs as well as the steering, or whether you're leading a special interest group, a war group, or whether you're leading a team at your, at your job, that the most important thing that we have to do is to make sure we have a, a backup plan, what to do for the things to survive longer than we are. How to make sure that if we are gone, for whatever reason, that there are people who can step up and replace us easily. Because that's the hardest thing. 
I know that each and every single one of us, and I know that I've been myself guilty of the same problem multiple times, that I want to be the unreplaceable because that's the best way to secure my job. That's not true. The best thing that you can do, and I can totally say what, what Dim said, is to make sure that you are replaceable. Because that means you can even go to PTO and not being bothered. Because there are people who can pick up your work. Or whatever happens, because we live in weird times and weird things happen from day to day. So being prepared is probably the best option. Nikita also mentioned the problems that we are seeing that are happening for over a year, almost two years now slowly, that another uh, after another employer is, is letting go a lot of people. And unfortunately, it so happens that a lot of those people that are primarily being hit by those layoffs are people uh, that are very close to open source, so that those are either op open source offices within various companies or people who are actually contributing. And a lot of people actually, over the past almost two years, left the Kubernetes project because they were either their position was removed, they got laid off, or because they were shifted to a different area of the company. And that, that's not a single instance that this happened. It happens in multiple places in the project, and it's continuing to happen again and again. That's why what Dims was saying, having the, the backup plan, having a sustainability plan is so crucial, and why we need to also make sure that each and every single employer today is aware that for the project to thrive, and pretty much every single one of us as we are sitting or standing here relies on the Kubernetes project one way or the other. Lachi mentioned that the community is bigger than any one country, politics, race, creed, gender, or religion. And that is so much true based on what I was talking about earlier today about the, the current steering members, about the past steering members, about what we are to one another today. And we, what we need to do is do we need to make sure that that strength is supported and that we are protecting it and, and making sure that it is able to thrive in the years to come. Christopher said that computers are hard, but humans are harder. And I remember talking with Christopher before I, I became a steering member or even before I decided to run for a steering because I knew that I can deal with computers. I can figure it out. In the worst case, I can throw out the keyboard and I get a new one. That's a little bit harder. Humans have, each and every single one of us has different needs, different thoughts. Uh, our language is also problematic. We don't all speak the same language. And even sometimes when we do communicate in the same language, the barrier between what our thoughts are running through our head and what our words can actually produce and what the other person actually hears is completely different. So it's important that we have the time and we have the capacity to talk to one another, cherish their, their relationships, and make sure that the people are being heard and their voices are being acted on. They mentioned that that's probably the, the biggest one. You have to know what, what you care about. And for me, being on the steering committee, I care the most about the, the current community, which is basically each and every single one of you, each and every single person that is currently present on this conference. So if you want to chat with us, I'll be here for a couple, for a couple more minutes. I will be also available in, in, at the Defense Unicorns booth later today during the booth crawl. If you want to chat about what the, uh, what the steering committee does or you have some awkward questions, I'm totally up and I can answer as much as I can, uh, whether that's about the, the work of the steering committee or the history of the Kubernetes project because I have some uh, weird stories, better, worse, whatever. 
Um, and most importantly, if you want to meet additional people from this amazing community, tomorrow at lunch, you can grab your lunch and, and pop to L1 hall, uh, level one halls A to three, A through C and one through five. I have no idea what that means, but I know that I'll be looking that same room. And when you see a group of people following in a particular direction with the bags, those are the SIG leads, so special interest group leaders, uh, work group leaders, if you want to know what each of those SIGs and work groups is working on, if you want to know, if you want to chat with me or other steering members, that's the place to be. You just grab your lunch. I don't know why, but we are always doing that. Thankfully, this time around, instead of saying SIG meet and greet, it's called SIG meet and greet lunch and learn. So yes, we will be joining together at lunch and talking cube. So. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to jump on to the mic. And we have a couple more minutes. If not, I'm, I'm happy to answer all the questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll hang around in that case and I'll answer in private questions. <laughs> 